And hey, welcome to another edition of Kyle Meredith with it's the interview series presented by WFPK at WFPK.org Consequence and the Consequence Podcast Network. Thank you so much, as always, for making your way here, checking out the series. Please do hit the subscribe button. You know how this game works. If you like what you see, I put out uh, three new interviews every single week, brand new and every Monday, Wednesday and Friday. So it's a great way to keep up with all your favorite artists. One of my all time favorite artists. I get the pleasure of talking with once again, Mr. Gavin Rosdell of Bush. Hello. How are you? Nice to see you. Yeah, I'm doing great. Uh, we got a few things to talk about, but um, uh, the, the reason uh, I reached out anyway, because it's the 20th anniversary. I got to do the backwards weatherman thing here. 20th uh-huh. anniversary of, uh, of this, little, this little gym right here. Right. The Golden State, which is getting the uh, deluxe edition and, and everything. Right. Uh, it's been fun to go back and, and, and revisit this one. This was, um, I don't know, you know, just jump into the questions here. As I, I listen to it now differently than I listened to it then. I mean, that's, that's going to happen naturally, but it really does sound like even more so in hindsight that this was the back to basics record. I mean, it was the back to that rock sound. What, what was the story going into this one? Um, that was, uh, well, I think that with, um, with Golden State, it was, it was a weird record because that just came out. My memory of that, overriding memory is is the whole thing of obviously the, the twin towers because that's when the twin towers were hit i was physically doing press at the met hotel in london and we watched like with a horror you know what i mean as the as the plane went into the first tower and then the second tower. so it's surrounded by that but and what's weird about it is that um we it was the first label first time we've been on a major label and we signed to Atlantic Records. And so it was this really weird situation of kind of being in people we didn't really know. Then it was, then we had the song was called uh, Speed Kills, which in England is a, it's a warning. It's a warning, Speed Kills, but people are like, you can't have those two words together. It's like, it's a warning, you know? So it turned into the people that we love. Then the cover, which was this art of, uh, the cover art was uh, the plane, because I was going, you know, that was the beginning, right in the middle of me and Gwen. So I was always on planes for the band and always on plane for my personal life. And so, and then the Golden, Golden State is where I was, you know, I wanted to record this uh, this record in, in, in America um, for the first time. And, um, you know, Dave Sardi, really, really amazing person. He introduced me to Chris Trainer, who then subsequently joined the band after that in 2002. So it's like really full of all these memories and, and out of this world, you know, we got the, the privilege of, of being able to view the, um, the, the site of the, of the 9-11 attacks while it was still smoldering. And uh, my friend took the video footage of it and we were with a, a policeman that, we, that I know, that we know, a marshal, we know really good, so we were allowed. And so I just remember that and that Golden State tour was just all about playing that elegiac, crazy footage and all the flowers and the people we lost set to that that track and with 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 uh, uh people that we love you know began and they're like oh, i don't want to play anything hard on the radio i just remember thinking out of this world is the most apt like like a lozenge you know an elixir against the time but yeah i, I mean i that record is full of massive memories and yeah, I think it feels like people Bush fans talk about the record that got away because it just, it just, it didn't, it didn't have the same impact because everything changed as that came out, you know. And I think everyone uh, at that time uh, wanted to not have rock music on rock stations. It's weird. So it's like full of all those memories. But the memory of making it is really beautiful. And like first time I made a record of America, the Village. And I couldn't believe how well they looked after you when you recorded and treated you like, would you like a coffee? Like in England, you know, people in studios at that point were like, you know, the assistant had the feet up reading the papers and like, you know, you'd be like, excuse me, can I get, it? like no service, no help, nothing like that. And come to America, man, California, and the village recorder, the, the history. And I just remember they were so, they just were such, it's a great treatment. I just, you know what I mean? It doesn't take a lot to treat people nice, but uh, it really had a, clearly a big effect. I never thought about it that much this day, but now when I think about it, yeah, they got coffee every day. And I rented a, uh, a Jag, um, a Jaguar, an old, like, a, like an old car dealer's car. 
Um, I don't know why I really liked it. I drove it. It was only after I found out that it was like really like three hundred dollars a day or something like that. And I'd be just like two grand a week to sit in the car park. I'm like a bit of a money burner. But um, yeah, great. You know, I, I'm really proud of the record. I always think that you know I've had so many records, luckily, and some been really successful, some more successful than others. It's just, is it? Does it stand the test of time? That's all it really. Do you know what I mean? Mm -hmm. So I hope it does. <laughs> well, like I said, it, it is fun. Like you, you like hit the overture of the entire interview with that answer. By the way, you hit on so many points that you know. Obviously, nine eleven became a part of it. it. wasn't originally a part of it. It did become a part of it. I was just getting my start in my career. I think I'd been in uh, only a year or two at that point. I was a music director of an alternative station, and I remember loving. Speed kills as as I got it originally, you know. Speed kills parentheses the people that we love, um, and of course there were those songs. Uh, I wasn't a part of one of the Clear Channel stations who you know got that blacklist of uh, of songs you couldn't play, but I, I remember everyone was definitely on edge about what you couldn't couldn't. Uh, I think we continued to play that song, but then it, it is interesting just the timing as you said because. You know, then you've got a song with the line, uh, I'm a terrorist inside. I mean, just like, what was it like seeing your songs taken from one context and made into something else that it wasn't originally intended? Because yeah, it was out of your hands. Yeah, I mean, you know, before 9-11, the idea of terrorists was not... Um, obviously a horrific word. It's a really powerful word. And so at my best, I'm terrorist inside was just the sort of thing of being sort of a maverick, you know, like leading away. It's nothing to do with violence. It's nothing to do with hurting people. I'm like freaking, you know, I'm in a rock band called Bush. It's like, I don't, you know, I don't want any trouble with anyone, you know? So it was nothing to do with like the, the reality of the world, like a poetic license, you know, pushed to an extreme. But when that came out, it suddenly was like, oh my God, I can't believe I put that word in there. Because we just hadn't really, I don't know, we just sort of, I guess we're so innocent. I mean, I'd grown up in England where you had uh, the IRA fighting the Protestant, Protestants. So they were like terrorists of kind. I grew up in that whole, uh, where I lived in, in London, you'd see the um, Orange Day, the Protestant marching, you'd know the pubs or IRA pubs. Biddy Mulligans was the Irish, he was the, you'd get stabbed in there if you're like a Protestant. It was like real, the real deal, right? The Cox Tavern, and I was like a kid, you know, 12, 13, I'd be growing up. And when I'd see people, like, for instance, the Orange Day Parade where the Protestants come out. It's just wild to know that, because they, they had their sort of militia segment to them. So as a kid, like, seeing people that are like, you think, wow, they really are terrorists. You know what I mean? That's the real deal. Oh, my God, don't look at them. Don't stare at them too long. they like, stab you, you know? And uh, so it's just a powerful line. You know, for me, I try and make, make my words as powerful as kind of... Um, exotic as possible you know and uh it was an unlucky choice and then coupled with the plane the plane it was actually i'm, I'm sure you must have seen the image it was a really good mm -hmm. album title a uh, uh, cover art and i worked really hard on it um with uh, the guy up at atlantic actually martin or Goldshire, or whatever his name was and then that one went to poop and then it was like okay make it gold so that was a bit, so it kept on being a reduced version of what it was i think that if you if you're going back was i mean like like Dave Chappelle is like, fuck you, I stand by what I say. Right, you know what I mean? Okay. But it's like this sort of, you know, everyone wants to backtrack. And uh, I was the, I was like, the album title, the, the, the album cover, the song name, the, at my best on Terrorist Inside, at my best on It's All Me, you know? And um, so I think when you're doing that, you kind of tend to lose your balance. And so that's why it has this sort of, and then being with Atlantic, who just were awful and just didn't have any solutions for, didn't say, okay, we can't play that song, but look, out of this world, you're playing at the shows, it's like an anthem, that's a beautiful thing. Let's do something with that, let's make something beautiful. No, they just like went off. It was like typical, what you have major labels. They, it was a massive deal we got with them, but it was the worst, worst, worst label in the world. Oh my God. Yeah. Um, so I that was just unfortunate. That was just a really unfortunate thing. And then that means that you then have, these um it becomes like a, a relatively secret record you know we'd be used to like you know all these number ones and that was like that went away a little bit but such was life i'm looking at the numbers 
I mean, what you do is like if you if you stick around um, long enough, you're gonna have all kind of um, things happen to your records. You know, mm-hmm. I've had you know with this interview it's not about other records, but every every record has its it's a sort of snapshot of time, isn't it? And you you know, I mean, I just had uh, this last record, um, the Kingdom, which was a you know really did well in lots of streams, but you know, obviously, Corona shut us all down. So that that was done, you know. So it's been unfortunate. Yeah, I, and a lot of the musicians, um, it's been interesting, musicians that have been around long enough that, it, that are in the similar boat that have had an album come out in 2001 and had to deal with 9-11 and then had a pandemic album and how the two sort of related in story. You know, it's, um, it but is you unfortunate. Funny, you know what I found weird when I was growing up, right, was... Um, you know, liking, say, I really love, like, you know, I love Neil Young. He's amazing. And then when you, as you get older, you realize, oh, wow, look, there's four records in between those two songs that I liked. You know, there's all this material. So if, mm. you, if you're around long enough, you just, I know, you, you amass a lot of material. And I think in those days, they, they spent, they were quicker. They'd write a record and, you know, two records a year and touring. And who knows mm. what, how they did it, but that's how they do it. So I don't know. Yeah. Well, uh, you're right, though. Out of This World is a beautiful song. It is one that I revisit and and inflatable. Uh, yeah. That is one of the prettiest songs. And I remember getting the single to that one, too. And just, I mean, just being floored the first time I heard that. You've always done great on those ballads. Um, and they always stand out. I mean, I, you know, all the way back to the beginning. I know, but, the, but even today, there is something like... You know, everybody talks about the lightning in a bottle with songs, but there's magic in that one. For me, at least, yeah. inflatable. There's, I, real, I there's the, real magic. We did the Chris Isaac show um, up in Canada at that point, and I played that song on there. And it was so beautiful. He said to me, man, there's one hell of a song. That's your next hit. It, it wasn't because I was on a label that didn't know. You know, that was a great solution to the problem, of, like, makes them mellow. And we did, I, 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 there's this one guy that I wanted to work with forever Giuseppe Capitondi he made these amazing videos amazing videos finally he's going to work with us and we did the video about someone else it was like the worst creative decision ever so we just like on stage like Muppets and it's like it's not based on a deer hunter and that last uh, the wedding before they go away to Vietnam and uh really sweet kids were uh you know the boy and girl but they were the stars it's like we literally it's just it's just all kinds of wrong. And I think that it, it, it's a testament, actually, in fairness, to being surrounded by the right people that are... I didn't have a very good manager, um, and I had a terrible label. So before and since then, like now, I have a wonderful manager and, uh, and, and uh, a pretty supportive label. And it's, all, it's, it's a bit collaborative, you know. And so there we just, I don't know, just... I don't know, just was one calamity after another. Not the music, though, just a sort of, didn't, you know, if we made an incredible video, maybe that would have helped, but we made the least good video that we made, <laughs> just because it sounds so good, the idea. When we were doing it, I was thinking, but we're just sidemen in our video. We're just like literally playing this wedding, the video's all about these kids going away. I was like, oh, God, so... You know, as I say, it's beautiful to look back and thank you for your kind words about it. I, as I say, it's, I'd rather we look back and see quality than it's just sort of, you know, than otherwise. Yeah. Um, well, let's focus on the songs then just for a second, a- outside of the machine. Do you remember writing that one, Inflatable? Yeah, yes, I, I remember that. Um, I was still, I hadn't, I was, uh, yeah, I, I, I do remember writing it. Um, because um, it was finding this really weird little guitar part that fiddle with through. I like kind of uh, uh, pedal tone things, you know, so you just have these like cycles of repetition and certain notes that hold and then the melody moves around it. And then I remember that Dave Sardi played this solo on it. He played the kind of like twangy and it was, it was really contentious because like my, the guitar player, Nigel, was an amazing guitar player, but he's kept on playing all these bluesy solos all over it. And I was like, I don't know if that's the right approach, really. And then Dave just knocked one out. And I was like, wow, that's amazing. And then somehow it stayed. Oh, yeah, Nigel left. He went to England. He sort of was, he's, he came to America to record, but we spent the time at his house by the pool. And I think he said he had enough of being there. And he came home and somehow that solo stayed on there. So 
It's unfortunate. It's Dave, Dave Sardi's last solo, I think. <laughs> <laughs> that was happening, though. I mean, um, uh, Nigel left. Uh, Dave Venture left. Um, I mean, this, and, and it was the last Bush like record a of for a while. It's like a war of attrition with me. I'm always the last one standing. <laughs> I'm the Mark Smith of Bush. Did it feel like something was coming to an end around that time? I mean, here you are, you're making a great record. You're in the middle of writing, you're recording, you've done this, you know, many times before, maybe not knowing, or did you get a sense that, I don't know, that there might not be a Bush for a while after this? Like, when did that happen? That was, that was just like, I think that what happened was that Nigel, um, not to speak for him, but that was around the time when he started to reflect that he really hadn't missed the first few years of his first kid, you know, and he, he was about to have another baby and didn't want to forfeit that time. And then I think when we made the record in America, I just think he'd had enough of it. I mean, you know, he was, he, I've seen him in interviews talking about how the business got in the way. I don't, I don't know quite what it means. I think that we left a small label that had done really well for us to go to a big label and, and we left a great manager to go to a terrible manager. And we just got seduced by the wrong things. Um, we got seduced. It's like, you know, we went to, we got seduced. We woke up in the morning with like, not a very good manager and not a very good label but on paper they're meant to be the best they and i'm sure they are for some people just not for us it was a terrible uh mix um and nigel didn't like the the new manager uh and i thought the new manager you know i always believe in people i thought well, this is going to happen so it was, there was a lot of flux when i think about it and it's only in talking to you about it that i sort of unearth all these emotions ah, I'm gonna, um, I'm glad I could be here to help you with that. Thank you so much. Um, what a can of worms. So I could just tell that there was a, a, a not so much a rift between us. It was never, see, things with us were so English. It was never like character, personality, you know, disconnect. Like, I love those guys. Um, we never, we never had any arguments about anything. It just was more like we'd given our lives so much by then. That was uh, 1999, it was 2001, right, 2001. So yeah, it'd been like, you know, it'd been kind of a slog, six or seven years. And I think they just had enough and wanted a lifestyle change. And I'm still crazy ambitious. And I don't know why I just really like it. I'm like fired up and just, you know, like gung-ho. And um, they didn't share that enthusiasm. And you know, I don't know, he came, Nigel came from sort of a real kind of punk background where bands only lasted a certain amount of time. I think he saw, it's the exact same time, here's another one, he saw the strokes. Mm -hmm. He saw the strokes and the strokes had just come out with last night. And I was like, that's so cool, that's inspiring. He was like, that's so cool, we're done. That's the future. I was like, well, to some people, but to some people, they, I don't know. And so for him, that was a big, turning point which was in a way i really respected it because it was like not like someone like me who fucking hangs on for dear life and doesn't want to get like kicked off the off the out of the dance competition he's like you know what i've been dancing for seven or eight years sold millions of albums i've traveled the world i've had this family and i missed my first kid growing up and i'm not going to do it with my second or if we do tour you know really minimize it i was like you how can we we can't go up against people who want all the slots, want at radio, want slots on, on festivals, stuff like that. If we're sort of like part-timers, we're not doing the, you know, paying the dues. I just sort of old-fashioned. So, God, I didn't realize what a turning point the record was. Golden Station <laughs> in total state. <laughs> it's interesting that you said that because, you know, it's being the 30th anniversary of Nevermind, like that was the conversation then, you know, all the bands uh, that had come before. Right saw the writing on the wall with never mind i mean you've shown that you can coexist uh, obviously you know you continue your career after that so it's not like you went away once the strokes did in the same way maybe twisted sister went away i'm not comparing you right. to twisted sister by the way yeah, but I, <laughs> no, I'm, uh, yeah i mean yeah yeah i mean it all comes down to what what do you you know what you do it for and what your vocation is and nigel is a fucking amazing talented guitar player brilliant brilliant guitar player and he had just wanted a life switch i still love it i'm in my studio now the minute we finish i'm going to continue to work on songs from the new record i just because i love that 
I'd just been with my kids. I'm really full on with my kids and they're at school and they know they go back to their mums for a week. And I'm, I, I just, it's, the, I'm like literally excited about this. Like I, we will finish this interview then I'll like turn it on. And I had a great breakthrough in a song yesterday. There's a couple of things I got to put a vocal to and then tomorrow the engineer comes because I'm a horrible engineer. But, I can sort of get everything going and all my sections together and write and all that. And then I use like a like little iPhone dictaphone and get it going. And then when he comes in, then we put it all together and you know, it's kind of do like that. But so I think that's what it was. It was just a turning point. And uh, I, I I respect his position and I and I know that. And you know, we are I am hogging up the airwaves to a certain degree, but I've written some great battles on this new record, for example. But I would say if you like those other ones, you'll definitely like the songs I've written for this record. So this is exciting, you know, it's just, I, I, I believe that um, music is a, you know, like your career is a nice one, it's, you, it's a passion to do it, you know what I mean? Mm -hmm. A passion to do it, whether the 10 strokes or not, you know? I mean, I could look at so many bands I could look at and be like, oh, okay, no need to do this anymore. You know, like certain great big bands, but I've always had this uh, idea that, um, People just need great records. It doesn't matter if they have, you know, wouldn't you love to have four records to you, you go between that you totally love? You don't need to have, you know, I remember when Nevermind came out, um, you know, Soundgarden and Loud and Love, whatever, that's kind of slightly looked over. That wasn't quite, you know, it was a Nirvana thing, but that's an equally brilliant record and equally brilliant band that sort of just found their place again. You know, you just, quality finds its place, I think. Yep. Yeah, I agree. Uh, you know, you and I got to talk about last year. The Kingdom was a fantastic record that I'm still listening to. And uh, the accompanying live album that came out with that. I mean, those get a lot of play around here. You know, so thankfully you continued with that stuff because you're still making quality records. And <clears throat> as a greedy fan, the only thing I want you to do is to hurry up and make new music. But I still have more questions. <laughs> so I'm getting in my own way right now. And I only want to bring up that it is the 20th anniversary of this, meaning that there is a 20th uh, anniversary deluxe edition coming out. And it does include a few of those B-sides with American Eyes and Japanese Freight Train and Fireball, which here's one of those things. An artist makes a decision at some points and some songs make it and some songs might not feel right. I listen to Fireball now and I go, oh, my God, what an incredible song. You know, and, and it's one of those moments as a fan, we're like, how did this not make the record? Yeah, and I'm sure it was yeah. a decision at that point. Yeah, the, the, all those decisions are hard. You know, it's a high class problem. And uh, it's unusual that the actually real sleeper songs don't come out whatsoever because they're always kind of mining you for some, you know, Austrian deluxe edition. And you're like, they used to always for Japan, actually, traditionally. And Universal um interscope never had any acts it seemed i mean when when i knew that no doubt didn't do well in japan i was like that's got to be the label's fault <laughs> that's the you know what i mean if, if gwen wasn't right for japan she ain't right for anywhere so when they so we never unfortunately i love japan it's the greatest country i love it so much i never really did very well there we always played the liquid rooms we just stayed at a certain kind of level there and so they'd be the one place that always was insisting on, on bonus tracks. So I'd be like, no, until there's like a major audience there. I don't get the bonus tracks where the people are. <laughs> Crazy. But somehow that track um, never, never got. Um, and I, I funny because I listened to it the other day. I was like, oh, that's pretty good. I'm always waiting for it to, whenever I hear these extra tracks, I'm waiting for the one uh, reason. Because I think songs are as good as their weakest bit. So... I mean, they're not, because often we, like, we grew up with songs, choruses we love, and then sometimes if you, if you were to read the words of the verse, you're like, what's that bit? You know, that bit's where you're not paying attention. It's, too, it's all beavers and butthead, you know? It's like, where's the chorus? You know, quite a few songs I hear like that, where I'm like, what's this? And then you hear the chorus. But, so I'm always waiting for the weakest bit of the, uh, of the song. And in Fireball, I was like, wow, because that was what would turn me off a song if I played two songs next to each other. In, in a, even though one may have this great bit, if it's got a weaker section where I kind of lost the plot as a songwriter or whatever like that, I'm just going to explain that because, or edit it out. And uh, with Fireball, it was weird because I heard it, I was like, why, where, what's this? Why didn't this go somewhere? This is weird. So, you know, I remember, you know, I, as soon as I heard it, I was like, oh God, that track. I've written so many songs. It's crazy. 
Well, that's, I mean, you got fireball, bring up a famous one, like a broken TV bubbles, mm-hmm. you know, that, that type of stuff. I mean, you all have never, have you ever put out a B-sides record? You haven't, right? No. Yeah. No. Encouragement. That's what I'm throwing <laughs> here. Encouragement. We've never done a greatest hits and we've never done a B-sides. We, we've waited so long for the greatest hits. No one cares about greatest hits anymore. <laughs> Which, like, <laughs> remember back in the day, like, I don't know, five years ago, you could get like a, you know, you could be a big deal. You get an advance and you whole big thing, the greatest hits. I, I, it always confused me. I'd be like, why can't people just play the songs they like off the, oh no, they like it in one greatest hits. So we were like saving and saving. We've saved it so long, it's worthless now. <laughs> no one cares about greatest hits. Oh, shit. See, but the B-sides like record would still work because you press it to vinyl and now it's a it's a fan thing, you know. That's right. that's <clears throat> yeah. I, I there's something there's something as well that I do like. Um I think that there's something um human and touching about sort of doing things wrong. I always considered that we've generally done most things wrong, being in rock band in England during Britpop, come to America. You know, everything's everything's the wrong way around. So the fact that we never did a great hits is like because I always thought that was like you know, okay, it's a swan song. And, you know, I was like, no, don't rap because I can't bear the, I always want to go forward. And I love mm-hmm. what got us here. And I love the framework of all the history of all the songs. But as a songwriter, I'm like, you know, I always wanted to go forward. And I, I don't not play those songs. I still love all the songs, the hits that, that, that people know. I'm not mad at them at all, but I, you know what I mean? I just want to push forward, sure. push forward just a natural feeling yeah well and and you continue to do that um i'll quickly bring up not just in your music but in other arts as well meaning specifically right now you've also uh you're also part of a new indie film called uh called habits and uh once again i think you've pointed this out in a different interview pits you as a bad guy you've got a career as a bad guy where does that come from what is it is it the filmmakers look at you and say bad guy or is that what you're attracted to what a piece of shit um <laughs> Uh, I don't know. It seems to what I get offered. I think that until you play the, uh, you know, I never tried. I did one romantic comedy, to be honest. I never wanted to do that. I always thought doing it. I'd much rather be killed, be a bad guy, be a devil's emissary, be shot, be tortured, because it gives you longevity, <laughs> gives you returnability in film. If you're like, you know, you go in a romantic comedy and you're like a house painter falling in love with Reese Witherspoon or something like that. You've probably got that five minutes in your career unless you're really, unless you're Ryan Reynolds or something like that, right? And um, so I, <clears throat> they asked me, would I uh, read this film? Um, and it, it was a Little Black Book. And I, I was like, yeah, but it's a romantic comedy. And, you know, we, 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 our strategy is we're not doing that, right? Because we, you know, want to keep lean and mean. If I'm not, if I'm going to be in a movie, Keep it mean. So I went out to Canoga Park and said, we'll just take a meeting with Brittany Murphy. So that's a film with Brittany Murphy. Mm-hmm. And uh, I was like, yeah, but you know, I'm not doing it. I mean, I'll go out and meet her because I don't want to be rude, but I'm not going to. And it was Julia Roberts' producing partner and the director. And I was getting to this at Winnebago and Brittany Murphy led across me, took me by both hands and said, please, will you do this movie with me? I was like, of course I will. <laughs> <laughs> Fold it. Just of course. And weirdly, we had really good rapport in it, and I was a side character, but I all got cut out of the movie um, completely. I think maybe there's one scene that we left. They said that the tests came back, there was too much vibe between me and Brittany, and they didn't understand what my character was and why I was in it. So they cut me out. <laughs> they should have extended my part, grown it. You know? But so, right. so I generally have always played bad guys, and this one is no different. Um, they're more interesting, aren't they? I like people that, you know, we're all human, we're all mess up, and uh, we all could do better, we all try better. And um, so they're more interesting people to play. I mean, that guy in the habit is a washed up TV star selling cocaine to young Hollywood. I don't know why that's the only thing he could have done, <laughs> sell coke, but apparently that's all he could do. So I don't know, it just it was fun playing him and. I like acting. It's 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 fun, and uh, I think it's a great movie. Actually, Janelle Shirt. If I'm doing my next movie with her, doing mm. a movie with her now coming up, and um, she's brilliant. I think she's a really really talented director. So yeah, I like doing that. You know, I mean, nothing beats the the thrill of writing a song and and getting the output of a song together. 
but uh, it is fun making words come to life and you know being real I mean Bella Thorne is a really good actress so it was really fun uh, also Jamie um, from The Kills is mm -hmm. in Habit and I'm a huge fan of The Kills so I did a whole load of work with Jamie and that was really I was like you know a bit of a, a huge fan of his band but we didn't talk about music at all you know we just, we just worked went to work and I was thinking I didn't even know if he knew I was in a band or anything. You know, he's like cool and all that. And um, at the end of it, after like three or four days working together, like big hugs and really, we, we you know, 15 hours a day on the set, you know, um, I gave him a hug and I was like, I got to tell you, I love your band. Your band's unbelievable. It's one of my favorite bands. So they are literally one of my favorite bands. And he goes, oh man, I love your music too. I was thinking, oh, I don't know if he does. But it was a really nice thing to say. And he was really fun to work with. <laughs> yeah, looking at that cast too, because. Um... I'm a huge fan of the Kills too. In fact, I had Allison on the show not too long ago, but you got Jamie and Allison, you got uh, uh, Paris Jackson, Bella Thorne. I mean, everybody was a musician, basically. And hearing you say, but, you know, at least with Jamie, you didn't talk about music. And I'm like, that's, maybe you just don't talk about work at work. But I was like, oh, that's surprising. Just with all that, all that music talent in one place. Well, so much. I would love to. And I, I, it's only Corona I haven't seen him since because we vowed to, you know, to, to stay friends. Um, and he's in London now, so he missed the premiere, but uh, there's quite a bit of pressure on those things because especially indie movies, they move so quick. You've really got to know your lines. <laughs> You've really got to get your, have your act together or else you're just holding up a production that can't afford you. You know mm -hmm. what I mean? Production can't afford it. So I find myself, and I really work hardest thing you go show up on time know your lines and stand on your marks and that's the that's 93 percent of it because generally they've cast you because you look right you know so that's what I, that's what, i think that's what you concentrate on for jamie you know jamie was originally an actor do you know his band was formed was signed because someone saw him do a theater piece up at the um at edinburgh uh the edinburgh fringe festival mm -hmm. so he was for an actor so for him being doing a movie was a really big thing for him, I think. You know, and uh, he was really good in it. But we, when we spend time, we'd rehearse the, the scenes because you just, you know, it's all fun and games. You don't want to be the fucking one messing it up and ruining it for everyone and back to one everyone. And I've been on big movies where I've forgotten my lines and stuff like that. Oh, it's the word line. <laughs> it's just the worst feeling of the world. I had my first movie I ever did. It was called Game of Their Lives. And I played a soccer player. And so my, my audition was halfway out to improvise a speech, um, which I did. And I got the part. And then I had to go in the car park and kick the ball around over the cars three or four times with, a, with Eric Winalders because it was a soccer movie. And I spent a lot of soccer. So, so I, that's it. So when I got to film in uh, Brazil, um, the night before my big scene was a big speech, you know, like a ballroom full of meant to be for this, the World Cup. And so it's like, you know, 200 people or 100 people, it felt like 200, but it was 100, no, 150 people. It was a large ballroom. And I suddenly was like, hang on, I improvised the, the speech. So there's nothing for me to work on. So I was like writing it and putting it under David Anspor's uh, uh, door, the director. And he's like, yeah, yeah, it's great. And I was like, okay. And then we, so I do the speech is like, like that long. And then he'd be like, okay, take this bit out. Now I can't do that. Like I can only do songs from the first line. If I can't get the first line of a song, I can't tell you any lyrics. Once I get the first line, I can, I can do two hours or three hours. Of, it's not a problem. But so he did the worst thing for me, which is like, first of all, it was my first movie. Secondly, he would take large chunks out. So now I'm trying to act, but not memorize the words, actually mm -hmm. say the words. But now I'm a, And so just a couple of times, I just was like, I, I don't even know what the fuck is say. I've got no, I got no connection to the words, not even on the tip of my tongue nowhere and uh that was a oh that moment so i vowed then to just whenever i did movies to just shock people by um uh, always knowing my lines i w did a movie a uh, game um how to rob a bank which was a, a really potentially great movie it didn't work out so great but that was after a um, hundred million dollar movie I did a million dollar movie and we shot it downtown this bank and uh the poor extra so i'm gonna play a bank robber true to form you know bad guys i'm a bank robber and uh 
I'm in there, and this these poor extras are lying on the you know those lovely old banks of marble floors. Uh-huh. You know, like marble floor of a bank, like beautiful ornate right. floor ceiling, you know, amazing. Not great to lie on. It's freezing cold and stuff. We're all day, and they're in the sheets, right? And so I always I'm friendly with the extras because I don't like it when people aren't, you know. So I felt bad for them because they're like literally lying on the ground and it'd be this alleged hostage position, right? And I said to this girl, I said, How you doing? You're right down there. She goes, Yeah, yeah it's great. It's just so wonderful to be on a film where someone knows their lines. <laughs> I was like, where's she been? She's 12 hours on the marble floor, but the upshot is that I do know my lines. Yeah, that's all it took. You know, it only takes a little to go a long way in those instances <laughs> right there. That's, uh, that's cool. Well, I, I love hearing that you've got more on the way on that too. So yeah. that's that's great. Is this something you're shooting or you've already shot? I don't know what you can uh, say about it. We're just working on a script now. It's called The Edge of Nowhere. And we're just working on the script and just finessing that and uh, hopefully shoot it early next year. I mean, we, it's, 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 a, it's a, like a love story in reverse, super dark, super dark and really like a horror story. It's cool. Awesome. Well, I can't wait to see that one. Keep and in the, the meantime, keep what's the kids that? Cheerful. Keep the kids cheerful. <laughs> <laughs> what you do uh it's what you do especially i'm going to tie it all around with everything uh with you know some of my favorite slow songs too on this record here i keep doing that look at that it's there there you go <laughs> with golden state and uh with the kingdom and uh i love hearing that you're uh, already at work on some new one and you're promising me some good ballads as well so that's i'm gonna hold you to that uh, yeah, as much as i, I can i already have three i mean there's this float reasons land of living and and my engines with you and like we did a fast song you know what i should do one day is just do a regular not fast version of that i was always like at the time i was like we need a fast song you know i want that moment in the crowd where people go nuts and it was too fast for everyone <laughs> it was too fast no one knows what but that song uh was a poem i wrote for gwen actually and uh and turned it into a song and um i kind of you know did a romantic gesture then like took the romantic gesture back and put it into a song. <laughs> <laughs> because you can, because it's your song. Because I can, and I did, and I will. I'm proud. <laughs> <laughs> Gavin, uh, it's been fun, as always, talking to you. Thank you so much. Uh, congratulations, 20 years on this one right here. And, uh, and, and with The Kingdom, I, I do still love that record. And, uh, and I guess we'll, we'll see you next time you got something else. Yes, great. Thanks so much.